Thank you all for coming. My name is Peter Stanton. I am the publisher of uh, Metro West 495 Biz in the Worcester Business Journal, and we are pleased to be um, putting on this uh, economic forum event. Um, we have to thank our sponsors and, uh, and uh, partners. Our corporate sponsor is Windstream, and our partners in this event uh, are 495 Metro West Partnership, Framingham State University, and the Metro West Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I just want to say it's probably a year ago that we traded some phone calls with Paul Matthews and started to think about not just this forum, but a survey of employers. We then met uh, with Linda Van Goden and Michael Harrison at Framingham State University. And with that sort of brain trust, uh, put together not only uh, uh, the issue that sits on everyone's chair, which is a, uh, a view of employers on a lot of trends in the, in the Metro West area, but also this event where we're pleased to have several expert speakers who will give you their perspective on the marketplace. So I'd like to start by um, introducing, uh, just getting a few welcome remarks from State Senator Karen Spilker, who is here representing the second Middlesex in Norfolk District. Karen. Thank you, Peter, uh, and welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. At least I get somewhat of a response. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you in the Worcester Business Journal for co-hosting this, along with the partnership um, and, and their executive director in Windstream and the Chamber and Framingham State and all of the, the partners that have come together because that is what makes Metro West so strong, both economically and economic development uh, wise and otherwise. It's, we know the power of partnerships here. Um, and today I would just like to recognize also some of my esteemed colleagues are here. Senator Jamie Eldridge is here. Representative Chris Walsh. <laughs> Representative Tom Conroy and Representative Carolyn Dykema. Uh, welcome to Framingham. This is, is the heart of my Senate district, and we're happy to have you here. It's a great opportunity to see the work of the regional economic development organizations, which uh, was the one that commissioned the survey that Barry Bluestone will be talking about, and it's great to have him here. He, uh, he, the whole organization that he heads up does terrific work. Uh, the, the Regional Economic Development Organization was created back in 2010 under a bill that I was the chief author under the premise that regions know themselves the best and they have the opportunity to provide resources so that the regions can stay strong and be competitive. We are here in the Metro West. This is uh, one of the strongest economic engines for our state. We, keep, we helped keep Massachusetts humming, and we helped Massachusetts come out, out of the 2008 2009 recession. Uh, and we all are stakeholders here. So it's great to have you here. It's uh, wonderful to hear the results of some data so that we can continue to move forward. But I, I thank all of you for coming here, uh, and, and we will be working together over the weeks and months and years to come to continue to make the Metro West a place where businesses want to come here, grow here, and thrive here, and families want to come here, uh, go to school, work, and play here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Okay, and so we're going to ask a, a few folks uh, to come up and say just a couple remarks, and, and that is from our sponsors uh, and our partners. First will be John Reed, who's the Director of Sales uh, for, for Windstream in their Framingham branch. And John, I understand that's a pretty close. You didn't have too far to come to get to the hotel here this morning. Come on up for a couple minutes. So I wanted to welcome everybody for coming on this day of remembrance and thank you for the opportunity to be a corporate sponsor. Uh, Windstream is a provider of voice data network and cloud solutions for small to medium businesses up through enterprise size organizations. Um, as the director of sales, I get the, the nice opportunity to go out and meet with a lot of business owners, CIOs, CEOs to discuss how technology can help them reduce costs, create efficiencies, grow their organizations, you know, uh, increase the size and grow revenue. 
So I'm very excited today to hear more about how you know, we can grow this, um, the region of 495 and the Metro West and what the economic outlook looks. So thank you again for having us and look forward to it. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. Like uh, the 495 Partnership, we are also a regional economic development organization. We partner very closely and work together very often with the 495 Partnership in trying to bring the right resources to the business community out here. I also want to acknowledge my fellow chamber members, Sue Moriali lieber here from the Marlboro Chamber. I think Barbara... Is Barbara Clifford here in the back? No. Uh, Quarter 9 Chamber, Milford Regional Chamber, all participated in the survey, helped get the survey out to their members, so they had a very robust reading of how many uh, businesses had ideas about the economy here. So we are excited to be part of this, partnering, and we really look forward to hearing Dr. Bluestone speak about the results of the survey and what that means for our area. I hope that you will enjoy this morning. If you are interested in finding out more about any of our chambers or the partnership, there's a lot of information out in the back, and we are just delighted that so many of you have come here today to find out what's coming down the pike for the Metro West region. So I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. So first the bad news. I think the bad news is that over the last few years we can all relate to this sentiment. We've all been through this. The good news is our uh, survey results show that the economy is improving. The sentiment from you folks in the Metro West 495 area certainly show an improvement in the economy. Um, and I do have to look a little bit because my, what did they call this, the confidence screen is no longer there. Uh, approximately one third of the organizations that we surveyed um, basically said they'd be doing some hiring over the coming year. So I think that's an extremely positive sign as well. And most of the organizations also projecting revenue increases over the coming year. So of course that's couched a little bit with the, the bad economy over the last few years, but definitely things are looking up. Uh, some of the basic results also indicate that facility expansion in the Metro West area is gonna be not that significant over the coming year. And some of the biggest challenges, which you may have seen in the Business Journal uh, data, is healthcare costs and government regulation. And lastly, I'll close in, in, on a positive note showing you know, some of the main reasons that you're located here in the 495 Metro West area. So let's look at uh, a little bit of the data. You've seen this if you've read the Worcester uh, Business Journal. We had about 338 respondents in our survey, so thank you all uh, who responded to it. So a, a pretty substantial number over the next course of the next year or two, we're gonna look ways to increase that response rate as well to make the data even more valuable. So about almost 60% say that the conditions are better, but that's certainly a positive sign. On this slide, it may be a little bit uh, challenging to look at it at first glance. What I did was looked at, by size, employee size, 1 to 9, 10 to 19, and looked at the results based on the organization size. Uh, the blue line basically represents the proportion of the respondents in that category for the entire survey, just to get a sense of the ratio. And you can see 1 to 9, 10 to 19, pretty substantial um, component of the survey, but also a very positive, more positive outlook you see the red line a little bit. Some people are still a little bit leery of uh, the economy over the next year or so. So a little bit mixed, but overall very, very positive. And we had about 24 uh, respondents in the 500 or greater area. So that's a pretty uh, good number for a large size there. And the larger companies looking at very, much more positive than some of the smallers, but overall very, very good results. And this is another way of looking at it by putting them all together. The top line shows overall all survey respondents than the bottom uh, categories show again by size. And you can see over the next year, slightly improvement or significant improvement dominates the graph where the blue line basically saying probably about the same and very minimal uh, negativity in a sense where declining uh, slightly or significantly. Okay. Hiring, again positive note on hiring. Uh, we had about uh, 100, you know, 99 people out of the survey that said yes, we're going to be doing some hiring most likely over the next year, so almost one-third of the respondents. And again, broken down by size, you can see overall uh, some significant uh, hiring numbers that uh, people are projecting to do over the coming year, so an extremely positive sign again. So revenue. I didn't break it out by, by size, but uh, 
you know, one to 10% dominated. So we're looking at increased revenue between 1% uh, to over 20% or more in a number of the uh, firms as well, organizations that we surveyed. So again, very positive numbers. The numbers about decreasing very much more minimal. So again, very positive sign uh, looking for revenue increases over the coming year. So this is the facility expansion. Uh, less than 10% are saying yes, we're going to do some facility expansion. Uh, one of the learnings from the survey that we took out is, is some of the responses. We didn't include about service uh, area. You'll notice in the data from the journal we talked about office space, manufacturing facilities, R&D. So that was a good learning for us in, in going forward with our students to say, well, we need to take into account hospitals and others that don't really fit that category. We have significant businesses that are service oriented. So uh, we're going to look at uh, revising that question to get better data. Okay. But uh, only a very small number of folks have planned to reduce over the coming year. Single biggest important challenge or most important challenge facing Metro West, maybe not a huge surprise, uh, health care costs, government regulation is another, um, labor quality and cost of living kind of round out the top four of the most significant uh, areas for the challenges for us here in the Metro West area. Why do we, why do we uh, locate our businesses here? This is the same data. I'm presenting it in two different ways. Uh, the top line, proximity to clients. This was done on a one to nine scale and ranked them. So 40, almost 41% listed proximity to clients as the number one reason for locating in the 495 Metro West area. 15% affordability of real estate and then 11, a little over 11% about the labor quality. The graph below each one in, in the greens is the top three box. So they ranked it first, second, or third. So looking at that data in two different ways still show the same categories as the most significant reasons of why we're locating in this area. So almost 70% proximity to clients are the top three reason, the top, ranked it within the top three. Then affordability of real estate and again, labor quality. What was interesting, or I didn't put it on the graph, is uh, tax incentives was rated seven, eight, and nine consistently among the groups as well, which kind of makes sense. I don't know if there's that many tax incentives currently in the state of Massachusetts to get you come here. So basic conclusion, overall, the majority of respondents feel the economy is improving, so I think that is the good news. Again, the biggest concerns really are, are health care costs and, uh, and regulation coming forward. So uh, with that, I uh, want to thank a few folks as well, of course, the 495 Metro West Business Group, but I also want to thank the area chambers of commerce who were kind enough to send out the survey uh, to you and others, but I also want to thank those in the room who participated in the survey. Without your contribution, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, going forward, as I mentioned, working with our students, we're looking to sit down with some of the business leaders and you folks to find out what should we be asking, can we ask it in a different way, um, and are we capturing really the, the appropriate sentiment in the categories uh, um, of the 495 Metro West business as what you want to see and what you want to hear. So with that, I would hope that also going forward next year that you participate again and talk to your colleagues and when the survey comes out to try to get them to do it as well to increase our participation rate so we can make this data even more valuable for you. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure being here and I'm proud to be a part of this uh, partnership with, the, with you and the 495 Metro West Group. Peter? Thank you, Michael. That was a great recap, and I think it will uh, be an interesting context as we now um, get ready to hear from Barry Bluestone. So I'm going to introduce Barry, and once Barry's uh, presentation is through, he's going to stay up on the stage, and Bonnie's going to come up and, and bring up our next two speakers, and, and uh, we'll turn them into a panel of three uh, for some Q&A at the end. Um, I did my own sort of rewrite. You know, we ran... Uh, oh, one last thing. Um, I just want to make this comment on Michael's presentation. A lot of that data is in this publication, which is sitting on every chair in this room, presented in slightly different form with some articles. In addition to that, we're going to make Michael's presentation available online at the Worcester Business Journal website. And you'll also see a video of this event and these presentations. And we'll ask permission of the other speakers. I don't think we've achieved it yet. Um, if some of those presentations might also go online. So if you want to share some of this data or look at it more in detail, we'll try and put most of that online um, and send you an email since we have your contact info to let you know how to get it. Okay, so the introduction of Barry Bluestone. So 
Um, there's a big long bio uh, in, our, in our program today, and I don't want to read straight from it, but I will just summarize that Barry is the Russell and Andre Stearns Trustee Professor of Political Economy, the founding director of the Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy, and the dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University, period. I hope that that's not all on his business card. That's a long one, and if you look at a lot of his other accomplishments, he's directed a wide variety of studies on the impact of housing, on the over-reliance of property taxes, on the impact of state revenue sharing, of transit-oriented development on neighborhoods, and in 2012, he conducted a major study um, on the future of manufacturing in Massachusetts. Um, if he sounds like a prolific scholar, you're on the right trail. He's the author of hundreds of articles and the co-author of 11 books. Before coming to Northeastern in 99, Professor Bluestone taught political economy uh, for more than 25 years at BC and at UMass Boston. However, I think despite his strong uh, uh, commitment to Northeastern, uh, underneath it all, I think he probably still bleeds blue blood as he received a BA, an MA, and a PhD in economics all from the University of Michigan. And it's hard to get that blue blood out of those big M folks. So anyways, without further ado, uh, let me ask up uh, Barry Bluestone. Good morning. Oh, we even got our monitor back, which is great. Thanks to the folks who made this all work. It's wonderful to be back here in Metro West. Um, I know about half of you in the room, and I'll meet the other half of you because of all the work we've done uh, through Northeastern uh, with the Metro West communities and particularly with Bonnie and the Metro West Chamber. So it's always fun to be back here, uh, particularly because I learn as much from you uh, as I hope I'm helping you understand how the economy works. I also want to take my hat off to our colleagues at Framingham State for that wonderful work they're doing. Michael, thanks so much. What I'm going to do in my very few minutes is take you through a broader context for all of this. Uh, and I'm going to give you the unvarnished truth as someone who doesn't live in Metro West, well, on the edge if you consider Cambridge, um, <laughs> as how the economy looks today and where it's come from. So we're going to start with the national economy. We're going to look at the state economy. I then pull together data on three of our counties, uh, of which Metro West is a large portion. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about our manufacturing results. And then I'm going to do something I've never done before in an audience, and that is give you the first results of what we've done with our EDSAT, our Economic Development Assessment Tool, which the Metro West communities have taken part in and it is an eye-opener. So let's first of all take a look at the national economy. Uh, here is the growth in the country's gross domestic product since 1994, going through the second quarter of this year, through June of this year. And you'll see we had those wonderful times in the late 90s, the second Clinton administration, where the economy was actually growing as fast as it grew during World War II. Unemployment fell uh, to under 4% uh, nationwide. And then we hit the 2001 recession, and growth for the year was down to 1.2%. We then had some recovery through the middle of the 2000s, and then, of course, after 2005, as the housing bubble burst, the economy started going into trouble. We then had the financial collapse, and by 2009, uh, we were having a loss of uh, over 3% in our GDP, the worst recession since the Great Depression. And then recovery begins in 2010, uh, and we've been growing, but if you note, in order to be able to kind of cut deeply into our unemployment ranks, we need to grow the economy at about 3% per year. That's because productivity, the efficiency of our workforce is growing at about 2% a year, and our labor force until recently was growing at about 1% a year. So if you don't go at least at 3%, efficiency gains plus increases in the size of the labor force leave you with very high unemployment. Indeed, the problem uh, with the slow recovery is that since the 1970s, this was not only the deepest recession since the Great Depression, it has also been the slowest recovery after the recession. So if you look at the average recovery in the first four years after a recession in 1973, 
we were growing at 5% a year after the 1981 81 double dip recession we were growing at 5.1% and in more recent recessions we've been growing at at least 3% but over the last 4 years since the end the official end of the recession we've only been growing at 2.2% now what caused the great recession and then i'm going to ask why how are we growing now if you look at the factors that are important for what really undermined the economy beginning in the fourth quarter of 2007. The official regression, uh, recession begins December 2007. It's driven overwhelmingly by the housing bust. We had a 37% decline in housing investment between 2007 fourth quarter and 2009 second quarter. And secondly, we had a shattering of business investment down nearly one more than one-fifth. Indeed, it would have been much worse if we hadn't had federal government stimulus. And in fact, we probably could have used more of it. So you'll see we did well with net exports. That was good. But we also had an increase in federal expenditures through the stimulus and ARRA, the Recovery Act. And that kept it from being even worse than it was. Now, since 2009, third quarter, the economy has, been ex has grown by about 7.1% over that period of time, and it has been uh, stimulated by reinvestment in business, about 22% growth in business investment, and also a recovery in the housing market, with construction starting to come back online with 11%. But what keeps us from growing faster has been a loss of net exports. We're importing more, exporting less. The rest of Europe the rest of the world economy isn't buying much stuff because they're in worse recession than we were. But we've also had a cut in federal expenditures, which is devastating to Massachusetts, and a cut in state and local expenditures nationwide as a result of the fiscal crisis. So the economy is growing slowly, not because we aren't investing in the private sector, but because the public sector and foreign exports have fallen off. Okay. So that leaves us with unemployment that looks like this. We had a high point of 9.6%. We actually exceeded 10% in one of the months in 2010. But we've been kind of stuck at somewhere above 7%. We're down at 7.3% in the in August. That was just reported. Uh, but very, very high unemployment by any standard. And we still have 13 to 15 million people unemployed as a result. Um, if you look at personal disposable income, we have a problem not only that we have a lot of people out of work, but that, in fact, we still haven't got back to the personal income. You can think of this in terms of household incomes, incomes or family incomes that we had in 2008. And in fact, in the first quarter of this year, personal incomes actually dropped again. So we're not seeing many wage increases. We're, we're not seeing much increases in hours of work, and therefore, income, person personal income isn't growing. And of course, you need personal income to grow in order to get consumption going, which is the backbone of the economy. It's about three quarters of the economy. And people are nervous from the last few years about running their credit cards up. And therefore, we've not had quite the rapid growth that we need. Having said all that, one of the good news, possibly until recently, is that Massachusetts is leading the country. The bars show you gross state product, the equivalent of GDP for the state, the blue line shows you the GDP that I just showed you. And you'll notice um, that for 2010, 2011, 2012, and the first quarter of 2013, we led the country. We were ahead of the country. And that, until recently, was also the reason why our unemployment rate was well below the national rate. Um, we've, it looks like the second quarter of this year is going to come in a little, little bit low. But uh, the New England Economic Partnership uh, and the work of my colleague, Alan Clayton Matthews, at Northeastern University expects the third quarter and fourth quarter to improve. I think the jury's out on that one. We'll have to see what happens. But that's good news. And if you see how we recovered from the recession, you'll see it here in terms of uh, seasonally adjusted employment in Massachusetts. You see the big fall off uh, after 2008 plummeting. And then you see a very strong recovery, basically leading the country. The problem is, 
if you look at the very end for 2013, our employment growth stalled. In fact, it's a little lower today than it was in December of 2012. And I think a large part of that, we haven't analyzed it completely, is due to federal cutbacks, and of course Massachusetts is more dependent because of our defense industries, because of our universities, and because of our healthcare sector to get billions and billions of dollars every year. So we've seen that slowdown, but you see a very strong recovery there. In terms of unemployment, you saw us rise up to a peak of about 8.7%, lower than the 9.6% nationwide, then steady decline, but again, this year has not been kind to us, and unemployment has soared just since April from 6.4% to 7.2%. Now, be a little bit careful. These are first estimates put out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They could be revised, but the data seem to suggest that somehow in 2013, we've had some problems. Here is what it looks like if you look at the differential between the U.S. unemployment rate and the Massachusetts unemployment rate. By 2011, we were 1.6 percentage points lower than the nation. But since then, we've been growing a little bit slower in terms of unemployment and employment growth nationally, so that by July of this year, just a few months ago, that differential had shrunk to two-tenths of a point. Right now, it's about one-tenth of a point. We're about the same. But we did have that big boom. But again, I think the sequestration and what's happening with federal is important. The weakness in the European economy hurts us. 40% uh, of our exports go to Europe from Massachusetts, as opposed to about uh, 13 or 14% nationwide, because there's a lot of exports to the Pacific Rim uh, from the West Coast. So this affects us. Okay, so let's look at you. We've just heard that uh, businesses here in Metro West are pretty bullish. Uh, but uh, this is what it looks like if you add together the employment in those three counties, Middlesex, Norfolk, and Worcester, which overlaps with Metro West. And you'll see this sharp decline between 2001 and 2011, very much like the state, and then some pretty good recovery through the third quarter of 2012, the last data that the uh, state's Department of Labor provides. If we break it down by communities and time, you'll see Middles Middlesex County, where I live in Cambridge, Actually, between 2001 and 2007, when I thought we were booming, that actually took a 4% loss. We hit the recession early in, in Middlesex. Norfolk down only about 7 tenths of a percent, much less than Massachusetts, which was overall down by 1.2%. Worcester County actually grew between 01 and 07. And Metro West as a whole, however, because if you include Met Middlesex, was driven downward. 2007, 2011, the Great Recession. Middlesex actually begins to recover, a lot of that having to do with biotech in East Cambridge. Uh, but Norfolk and Worcester get hit pretty hard, and Metro West uh, is doing about the same as the state. And then here's the recovery. Big recovery in Middlesex, big recovery in Norfolk, not so much in Worcester. Overall, about a 1.1% growth in employment between uh, annual 2011 and the third quarter of 2012, still lagging behind the state, um, driven to a great extent by Suffolk County. So that's where we are. How about manufacturing? Well, as uh, Peter suggested, back in 2007, just before the Great Recession, perfect timing, we did an analysis of manufacturing statewide. In the course of that, we surveyed over 700 manufacturing firms out of the roughly 7,000 in the state. And we interviewed CEOs or owner managers in 60 of those companies. And out of that wrote a big, big report, which you can find on our website. But I want to give you some of the results from the survey because we did it again in 2012, last year. And this is what we found. In our early report in 2007, we said manufacturing's coming back. It's looking great. And a month after the report came out, the recession hit worst timing of any report I've done in 43 years at a university. And um, as a result, you saw employment in manufacturing statewide fall from about 290,000 jobs to about 250,000 jobs, and they could have continued falling. But even as the Great Recession or the entrails of it continued, manufacturing stabilized. And as of April of this year, I haven't been able to update the numbers, we were still at about 250,000, so we're surviving this 
in part because of the tremendous gains in productivity uh, that we've seen in manufacturing. Indeed, while many people have given up on manufacturing in the state, manufacturing remains the sixth largest employer in the state, and because it is the highest wage industry in the state, despite the fact that it has employment which is less than half the healthcare sector, it is the second highest payroll of all the industries in the state. And it remains a critical part of the state. Because of this work and others, I was pleased to see the governor create the Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative. We just had our major summit this summer at Gillette Stadium. Uh, and we are working very hard in this state to make sure we have a manufacturing base, which is important. The other thing about our state, which is so great, and I've been giving interviews for the last three months uh, since the Detroit bankruptcy, since I grew up in Detroit, and I know that well, and Detroit is lost. And part of the reason why it fell apart very early is it was a one industry town. It was auto and nothing else. I worked in a Ford plant. I worked my way through the University of Michigan building carburetors and planned obsolescence into Ford products during the 1960s. But what we have here in Massachusetts and what makes us so successful is in an unbelievable diversity of manufacturing. Our top industry is navigation, measuring, medical, and control instruments, very high-tech stuff. Semiconductors are still important. But we have lots of printing that we do here, big-style printing. We do, of course, computer and peripheral equipment, aerospace products, particularly for the aircraft engine industries of Pratt & Whitney and East Hartford and uh, AEG, Aircraft Engine Group of Lynn, uh, General Electric. Plastics products, lemon stirs, plastics capital of the world, medical equipment and supplies, and bakeries and tortilla makers. That's great. That's the diversity you want, because you can ride out recessions. But it's productivity that has made Massachusetts manufacturing so powerful. Uh, our best estimates is that between two 1997 and 2007, gross state product per worker was growing at almost 10% a year. That is 10% more output per worker per year in manufacturing compared with 2% for the state economy. And between 2007 and 2011, it remained about 9% a year. This is the use of advanced technologies to keep us competitive even when the competitor is in China or Cambodia or Vietnam, which I visited this summer. Okay. We also did a survey like Framingham, and it said, what do you think about the future over the next five years? 65% of the firms said they expect to continue production or increase it in Massachusetts. And in fact, we had a large proportion of firms said they expected to increase production by at least 25%. We asked about employment, and what we found is 70% of our manufacturers, this is a survey done last year, expected to increase their employment over the next five years. Uh, with 13%, one in seven firms, saying they expected to increase employment by 25% or more over the next five years. Massachusetts manufacturers are bullish, and this part of the state can take advantage of that. Finally, I just want to close by talking about what we've done at Northeastern using our economic development self-assessment tool. Uh, and all of you in the Metro West have been through this uh, process where we provide a survey instrument with 220 questions, everything you'd ever want to know about uh, business uh, and how well the communities are doing. And now, for the first time, and you're the first audience to see it, we've kind of analyzed some of the results across all, uh, across 19 uh, working cities. I'm working at the Boston Fed this year. These are older industrial cities. And we're about ready to analyze all the data, including from your communities here. And so I want to give you just a last bit of results on this. We began this project, and we've expanded the economic development self-assessment tool, working with now over 60 communities in Massachusetts and nearly 100 nationwide, many in Rhode Island, Connecticut, is that with federal deficits and with the call for tax cuts, there's going to be very little additional federal aid for the next decade. It's just not going to happen. Medical care costs, pension costs, are going to wipe out aid from the federal government. And we're already seeing the harm it does to our state in the first six months of this year. And second of all, and I work with Glenn Shore, the Secretary of Administration and Finance, and with our friends here from the legislature, and I'm on the new Tax Fairness Commission, we know there are going to be structural deficits because of pensions, because of health care and other costs. 
that will make it very difficult for the state to continue to provide the kind of local aid that it once provided. And what that means is that in this new economic environment, we're on our own in the communities. The only way we're going to be able to continue to provide the public services, the infrastructure, the schooling we need is for the local communities to continue to be able to expand their tax base. And that means not taxing individual firms more, but bringing more firms, more employment, more jobs to your community. So how do you do that? How do you attract it? Well, what we did is we created EDSAT with the fundamental proposition that cities and towns have the ability to create their own destiny. I want to underline that because you're going to see our results in a minute. And they can benefit from having sophisticated partners who can help them develop tools and information to compete successfully. They can control their own destiny. That was a theory. That was a hypothesis behind the development of our economic development assessment tool. I wasn't sure it would bear out if we had empirical data, but my hypothesis was you can control your own destiny. And what we said is you have to become the CEO for economic development. If you're a mayor or the town manager or a selectman, uh, or for that matter, work on your ZBA, your Zoning Board of Appeals. You have to be part of the team around economic development. And you have to assess your municipality's strengths and weaknesses in order to be able to do that job well. And you need to be, figure out how to change what you have control over if it's a barrier to economic development. And you have to collaborate between business community and public leaders in doing that, as you're doing very well here in Metro West. And we found out what the deal breakers are. The deal breakers are what the site and location specialists we've worked with, 250 around the country, who help firms decide where to locate. They said the most important thing in the 21st century is, quote, unquote, time to market. We heard that over and over again. There's just no time. We have to race in this global market. Just think about how often a new phone comes out to compete with iPhones, Samsung, Nokia. That time to market is important. Anything that slows us down is disaster. So we need communities where we can get our work done and more than ever get it done quickly. And that means we have to have cities and towns we can work with. The other thing we learned from these location specialists is that firms and these location specialists who help these firms make decisions where to locate have cognitive maps about every community. They know about Detroit. Do they know about Northboro? And if they do, what's the cognitive map they have about Northboro or Southboro or Natick or Framingham or Westboro? And how does that cognitive map line up against not only other communities in Massachusetts, but Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Often those cognitive maps are out of date. You've changed what you did. We still hear the term Taxachusetts once in a while. We're no longer Taxachusetts. We're in the middle of the pack nationwide, 26th in terms of our total tax burden. But those cognitive maps linger, and what's critical is using your economic development strategies to change those cognitive maps to put them in line with what you're doing today. Often there's not enough attention to site deficiencies, not just brownfield, but grayfield, and so forth. And often slow municipal processes, which drive these companies crazy. Too much reliance on tax breaks, and I think you heard something about that. So what we did with EDSAT was we created a survey, done all of your communities here with the chamber and working with the communities, and we did this kind of assessment. Um, and the result was that we looked at permitting processes, labor, development and operating costs, the business environment, transportation and access, quality of life and the social environment, the amenities of your community, and then we asked people which ones are most important. They told us proximity to major highways, rents and land costs, the availability of appropriate labor pool, permitting approvals and appeals processes, and amenities and services. That's what the location specialists told us were important. So what do we do? As I said, we created EDSAT, and we asked, things in, asked questions in 10 topics. Your access to customers and markets in your community, your concentration of business and services. Do you have an agglomeration, let's say, in the health sciences or plastics, the cost of land, the quality of your labor force, municipal processes like zoning appeals and building inspections, 
the kind of economic development marketing you might do of your community, the quality of life in your community, the quality of life around the individual development sites you have. Do you have restaurants? Do you have uh, a community that people want to live and work in? Business incentives, tax rates, and access to information. What's your website like? Northborough. Okay. And we've seen over the last five years that individual communities have used this to refine their economic development goals, to identify deal breakers, those kinds of things that keep businesses from coming to your community, and figure out how to turn them into deal makers, and to benchmark your economic development efforts and your plan against other communities and integrate all of this into your master planning. Okay? It's also been used for marketing the community when they find out, boy, they're doing better than they thought. And it's been used for regional collaboration. No better example of that than here in 495 Metro West. A better understanding of how you integrate your municipal processes so they're all aligned for business development, employment growth, and growing your tax base. And better understanding the entire economic development process. As I said, in closing, I want to give you the final results. So what we did is I took all the data for this initial 19 cities that we've been working on with the Boston Fed, these working cities. And these are not well-to-do cities. So this is our, our, our gateway cities, our older industrial cities, none of them in this room. And I collected data on what has happened to the number of establishments in each of those communities and the change in the number of establishments between 2001 and 2007, 2007 and 2011, and then the whole period, 2001 to 2011. And then we ran those against all 220 variables were covered in those 10 areas. And I asked the question, which variables, which factors were most correlated with success in building the number of establishments and growing your employment in these communities? Now again, it's a preliminary analysis because it's on a small data set, and we're looking at older industrial cities. We're redoing this now with all 50 cities that we have in our database now. But here is what we found. And I must admit, I had no idea what the results were. I love studies where I go in and I have no idea what the findings will be like. But what turned out, out of 220 variables, to have the highest correlation with the rate of growth in the number of establishments in these communities? The very first one was fast track permitting. Remember we said time to market? It turns out empirically, those communities that allow for fast track permitting had the fastest growth in the number of establishments. The second for growing establishments was low tax rates, not tax incentives. But this had to do mainly with, it turns out, the ability to generate lots of small little mom and pop businesses. For them, property taxes are important. Third was school quality. That turned out to be critical in terms of where you got a lot of establishments grown. The fourth was timeliness of approvals. That's like fast track permitting. Highway access, of course, was important. Having available development sites were important. And finally, how well does that community market its economic development opportunities? Right? And then we asked, what about growth in employment? What really drives growth in employment? Number one, obviously, you have to have available development sites in order to attract businesses that create jobs. Number two out of 220 variables was how good a job you do marketing your community. Number two. Number three, timely, so, timeliness of approvals. How well does your community do in getting a zoning variance through or any other kind of, of approval you'll need? Site amenities are important. Do you have restaurants? Do you have parks? Do you have other things like that? You need to have parking. That's important. Marketing follow-up. Those communities that followed up and asked their firms, why did you come here or why did you leave? Do better. And fast-track permitting. So I said at the beginning, our hypothesis was that local communities, in terms of economic development, can control their own destiny. These variables show that that's true. What's interesting is variables that I thought would be really important didn't turn out to be important. Crime rates don't matter, at least in terms of economic development. They matter in terms of quality of life. 
giving all kinds of tax breaks, zero correlation with establishment growth, within, with, uh, with uh, economic growth, employment growth. Um, a lot of those variables turned out not to be important. But these are the ones that you have control over, or many of these, and you can make a difference. So thank you very much for listening to this little presentation. I hope it's given you a little idea of the context. And I guess my last line would be, we've done very well until quite recently over the last four years since the recovery began. But to win in this game, to remain a leader in economic development, to grow your economies, to grow family incomes, requires constant vigilance and constant attention to building the relationship between the, build, the business community and political leaders and building regional collaboration. Those are the tools you have to make sure that Metro West remains one of the most prosperous regions, not only in Massachusetts, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Thank you very much. Barry, great job. It's always a pleasure to listen, to listen to you and to hear all of the facts and figures you present. I don't know how you keep it all together, but really helpful and informative. Appreciate, your, appreciate your being here. Uh, we have two more panelists this morning. I am delighted to ask Kevin Lawrence to come up. Kevin is the Director of Corporate Communications for MathWorks, a leading provider of mathematical computing software based in Natick. And they are expanding like mad. He's going to tell you a little bit about that. In his position, Kevin is responsible for driving the company's advertising, public relations, employee communications, social media, and community relations program. So you can see he's a pretty busy guy. Kevin brings to his current role more than 25 years of marketing and communications experience in the high technology, publishing, and financial services industries prior to joining MathWorks in 2008. He served as Vice President Corporate Communications for Perkin Elmer Inc., a $2 billion supplier of scientific instrumentation and software based in Waltham. And before this, he was Vice President Corporate Marketing and Communications for Thomson Financial, now Thomson Reuters, based in Boston. Kevin holds an MBA from Babson College and a bachelor's degree in communications from Boston University. Currently resides in Wayland with his wife, Karen, and their two children, Rachel and Sean. Welcome, Kevin. Wow, she read the whole bio. You all stayed awake. That's great. So thank you. Good morning. It's still morning, right? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here representing MathWorks. Um, and so I guess uh, we're being positioned as uh, having done fairly well over the last few years, and it's been a great ride in the five years that I've been with the company. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about who we are, sort of set the context of why we think things have been going well for us over the last few years, uh, and then give you a little bit of a, um, I don't want to say prognostication, because uh, I don't want to get in trouble with Barry here, but a little bit about what we see ahead in terms of our outlook for the future, uh, at least short term. Okay, So first, a little bit about who we are. So we're a math software company. So prior to joining the company five years ago, like many of you, I drove by the Natick campus on Route 9, saw the MathWorks sign, and wondered if they actually employed adults there. Math games for kids, right? So not quite. Uh, our software is used by engineers and scientists around the world to accelerate the pace of learning and innovation. Chances are the car that you drive, the phone you use, and increasingly the appliances and the systems in your house, like heating, um, contain embedded software that was created using our products. There are now more smart systems in the world than people. And the numbers are growing rapidly. And so our tools make them possible. Oops. So those tools are called MATLAB and Simulink. So we run spots on NPR each day that mention we're the makers of MATLAB and Simulink. And so I'll be at a cocktail party. And I'll tell people I work for MathWorks. And they'll say, oh, makers of MATLAB and Simulink. <laughs> I'll go, that, that's right. So 
do you know what they are? They say, I have no clue. <laughs> but I hear it every day on the radio. So without getting too technical, MATLAB is essentially a programming language. It's like Fortran or BASIC. Anybody study Fortran and BASIC back in high school? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it helps our uh, customers solve problems and really think through and really vet their ideas. Like, what would happen to the gas mileage of this car if we increase the air intake into the engine? Or if you're in the financial services arena, how would a rise in the price of oil affect my portfolio of performance? Simulink then allows these engineers to build computer models that turn these ideas into graphical systems. You can then simulate the performance of these systems without having to build physical models. And finally, we can help them produce the software code that actually gets embedded into these microprocessors and boards that actually help the products run. So that's what we do. A lot of people always ask, what do you guys do? That's what we're all about. As I mentioned, these smart systems are everywhere. And so our customer base is made up of a wide range of industries. No one customer or segment represents a majority of our sales, which means slowdowns in some areas are usually offset by gains in others. And while commercial industry makes up the lion's share of our revenues, academia actually does make up the largest percentage of our users. Our products are used as teaching tools by more than 5,000 universities worldwide, including a majority of the top 10, top 10, top 300 universities worldwide. Millions of engineering students learn how to use MATLAB and Simulink, and they, their use in schools then helps them transition nicely over to industry. So currently, if you look at monster.com, uh, engineering jobs requiring MATLAB skills exceed those of the nearest commercial competitor by a ratio of about six to one. All right, some more numbers. So we surpassed three quarters of a billion dollars in sales in 2012, with more than 60% of our sales coming from countries outside the US. And that's been the case for several years now. MathWorks will actually celebrate its 30th anniversary next year, having been profitable in each of those years. We have 3,000 people serving well over a million registered customers in nearly 200 countries. And earlier this year, we were named one of the top 50 Best places to work in the United States by the job site Glassdoor.com. So that's great. That's actually based on surveys and, and comments on the site by both current as well as our former employees. So we're pretty proud of that. So a little bit more about these 3,000 people. Almost 2,000 of them are located right here in Natick. We have additional US offices located in some of our major market hubs and more than a dozen field offices in Europe and Asia. We hired more than 400 people in 2012 and plan to add approximately 300 more this year. So with that as a backdrop, um, what, what's, what's it look like ahead for us here? And this is actually a view out of one of our uh, office windows in Natick. So let's start with the technology trends. We've already talked about the growth of smart systems. They're in everything and the numbers continue to grow. 30 years ago, the average car had five to 10 embedded microprocessors under the hood. Today's average car has somewhere between 50 and 75, and most luxury class vehicles have more than 100 microprocessors, controlling everything from navigation to transmission, infotainment, environment, and safety, safety systems. Now, complementing this, Hardware is cheap and plentiful, and that's much to the chagrin of PC manufacturers and much to the delight of a new generation of innovators and inventors. So dubbed the maker movement, there's a growing number of professionals, students, and hobbyists tinkering with low cost but extremely powerful processing boards. Like this board here, that's an, it's called an Arduino board, it retails for about $25 which enable people to build amazing things like robots. 20 years ago, getting this little Lego robot to work would have taken a team of PhDs programming it using very expensive equipment. Now your six-year-old can do it. And with our software, they don't need to know programming. So this is a real opportunity for us to extend our reach into the pre-professional market. 
So these boards are just one example of how computing power is extending well beyond traditional computers. Think of all the apps on your smartphone, which are just prepackaged little computer programs. You heard somebody talking about, uh, actually, Sponsors Windstream talked about cloud computing. And that basically means you can do a lot more with less storage and less memory on your device. And who's heard of the Internet of Things? Who's heard of the Internet? One person. One person. The Internet of Things, that's a new buzzword now. So basically that's the idea that many things that you use in your daily life are quickly learning to talk to each other. Pretty soon your washing machine will diagnose itself and tell your phone you need to replace a $5 part to avoid a costly repair later. We'll move from self-parking cars today to self-driving cars to eventually intelligent highway networks. Literally, where everything is basically talking to each other to avoid accidents. will really, literally make fatalities a thing of the past. It's exciting, it's a little scary, but the technology is here, it's real. Finally, all this computing power is generating a ton of data. Computers can generate it and even store it, but there's so much of it, it's really hard for any of us to do any with it, anything with it. It's actually hard for a lot of computers to do anything with it. This is what they call the big data dilemma, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. But imagine if programs could be written that not, not only answer questions about the data that you're asking, but actually give you answers and insight to the data that you didn't know, that you didn't ask yet. That's the promise of an emerging field called data science, and it's happening now. So obviously these are all exciting and exceptional opportunities for a business, but we're not without our challenges. We're not the only ones that see these trends. And competition in the form of what are called open source languages and new commercial programming languages is growing. There's been significant work done by global governments to protect intellectual property and to reduce software piracy. But for the distance to com that we've come, we've got miles and miles to go before we sleep. In China alone, piracy rates still exceed 75% of all software installed. And in places like Indonesia and Venezuela, that rate is closer to 90%. Also, our pipeline of customers and employees is reliant on students pursuing careers in what's called science, technology, and engineering math, STEM. As most of you know, those numbers have declined over the past decade. According to a recent nationwide study, baby boomer retirements are expected to deplete the science and technology workforce in the US by over 50% in the next decade. Nationally, 28% of high school students taking the SATs indicated that they were interested in pursuing these STEM careers. And while Massachusetts is acknowledged to be a leader in discovery and innovation, that number is only 22% in the Commonwealth. So that's a real issue for us. Okay, so here's where I start talking out of school, literally. Um, here's the economic lens, first starting with our global perspective. So in 2010, we began a period of exceptional growth. As the world saw the first signs of recovery from the recession, companies began to invest heavily in R&D again, trying to gain competitive advantage through innovation. R&D, in, in many respects, our business is kind of a leading indicator because companies will tend to invest in R&D before they really start the manufacturing engine rolling. So this was great news for us. Now, as we head towards the end of 2013 and into 2014, sales volumes remain equal or better to the prior year, but the high growth rates get harder to maintain. It's just the law of big numbers. So this is what we're seeing across the regions right now. In the U.S., the new normal continues. Slow recovery from the recession characterized by strong corporate profits, but more cautious spending. Growth for us is strongest in newer markets, including energy production and distribution, and actually medical devices. We also have seen very good growth in the education market, with more universities focusing on project-based learning. That's the kind of thing you do with those boards I show you, like those robots. And the advent of something called massive open online courses. What are those? MOOCs, as they're called, which can be taught effectively using our products. Now, it's mostly the same story in Europe from an industry standpoint, but as Barry mentioned, the debt crisis still continues to weigh heavily on a lot of, a lot of countries. We do see some signs of recovery, 
and expect that we'll see stronger growth in Europe next year. And the news from Asia remains extremely positive. Strong growth coming from both emerging nations as well as our established markets like Japan, where you'd expect technology to still be uh, very much in the lead. So closer to home, I, I don't have any figures on sales in Massachusetts, but I can speak to a, a couple of things that may affect us in the near term. First, many of you may be aware of the software services tax that just went into effect in Massachusetts on July 31st. This is one that still holds a lot of questions for us. So we absolutely support the need to improve the infrastructure in the Commonwealth, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. What's not clear to us is the impact on innovation this will have here in the state. Suffice it to say, we've been working to understand its implications for us and our local customers and continue to watch the situation develop. Secondly, and more importantly, attracting and retaining top talent remains a high priority. Mass, math works. is never good at math. Hires the best and brightest technical minds right out of school. And while Boston is a major recruiting hub for us, we look for talent around the world. So how do we entice students to stay in the region and attract those from elsewhere to come and live and work here? So I could talk a lot about the programs and the benefits that MathWorks offers to its staff, and they're great. But as important are the incentives that the Metro West area affords us. You heard Barry talk. First is location, right? Proximity to the city at a major uh, international airport close to the major highways. We covered that. But encouraging professionals to reside here requires more than a focus on careers. We've got to provide them with a range of accommodation through all their life stages. So when we talk to a lot of our folks, this is what they tell us. Affordable housing, mass transit options, access to art, entertainment, and cultural centers for those just starting out. And that's a large percentage of our population. Also, 60% of our staff have advanced degrees. So access to continuing education programs is important to new grads. Great schools, hospitals, and neighborhood safety for families, obviously, and then health and welfare services for older residents. And we have a few seniors working for us, believe it or not. These are all strong selling points for Metro West and for MathWorks. But of course, there's always more that can be done. So here are some things we expect to continue to partner on with our local officials and officials at the state level. So STEM programs that fuel interest in the technical disciplines. So the Digits program and the Mass State Science and Engineering Fair, great examples of public-private partnerships in which we're involved. In addition to focusing on students, we'd like to see more teacher training and support programs. Innovation incentives. And again, can't be too specific here other than to say I agree that it's not all in the form of tax incentives. Commonwealth's undertaken a number of good initiatives to promote an innovation economy. We'd like to see more in initiatives to support high-tech entrepreneurs like those coming from the maker movement I mentioned. We can do more to help these people start businesses and obviously do more to help them stay in the state once they start becoming successful. And finally, we must continue to invest in our infrastructure. As mentioned, affordable housing, quality education, better services, support recreational cultural centers, help attract and retain the people that we need to continue our long-term growth. Which remains our focus for 2014? We are absolutely positively, um, our strategies always, have always been grow for the long term. Along with continuing to meet our hiring goals for the next year and continuing to build out our own infrastructure, which now includes the Boston, uh, former Boston Scientific Campus in Natick, which we purchased earlier this year. So, which is hopefully a nice segue into my colleague from the real estate business here. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. That was really helpful to hear how your story has built such a great empire along Route 9 there. Uh, if you haven't been to the new campus, the, they have been adding to their campus over the years. If you haven't been there recently, I would encourage you to, to visit. It is quite a remarkable place, and it's so wonderful to have them located here in Metro West. So it's a great place to work. If you know anyone, in, in, an engineer or something, point them in Kevin's direction. Please. Our next guest speaker 
is Chris Tosti. Many of you here in the room probably know Chris, uh, who has been working in this area for quite a long while. Chris Tosti is Executive Vice President and Partner for C.B. Richard Ellis New England Partners LP, a joint venture between Whittier Partners Group LLC and CBRE. That's a lot of letters there. The world's largest commercial real estate services company. Based in Boston, Mr. Tosti joined the company in 1995 and represents tenants, corporate clients, and landlords throughout the greater Mar Boston market. His prior experience includes 11 years with Leggett, McCall, Grubb, and Ellis, and four years with Prime Computer. He holds a bachelor's degree with Boston University and an MBA from Babson College. Welcome, Chris Tosti. Oh, this is uh, just the way it looks, right? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I know what it means to go last at these things because I've sat out there before. So I was thinking of asking everybody to get up and do a few jumping jacks. Is that anybody want to do that or <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, I'll at least try to be brief. <clears throat> um, and talk about the commercial real estate market. I'm going to focus on the Metro West, but, but first start with a little bit of an overview because as a firm, we cover the waterfront, all of New England, actually all of the world. We're, we're a large company. We're always battling that, actually, because real estate um, is really a very local thing. And while we are very proud of some of the, the, the business that we do, our average deal size is about 7,000 square feet. So, you know, we do, uh, we do the small stuff so that we get the chance to do the big stuff occasionally as well. Um, and then just one more quick thing about CB. We're, we're real estate service providers. We don't, we're not owners, right? So we do pretty much every service except the lawyering. Leave that to the lawyers. And, and the architecture. But everything in between, we're, we're giving what we think is, is pretty good advice. So let's start with some stats. Um, I hate to follow somebody like a MATLAB and a Simulink thing with, with real estate stats because it's boring. But I'll try to uh, liven it up just a little bit. And actually, one of the things we do to, to really confuse you is um, when we talk about vacancy, we have an availability stat that's related to vacancy and a vacancy stat. And there's a difference, obviously. Um, vacancy is, is what's dark, what, what is truly vacant space. And available space is what is dark space plus space where tenants are in, uh, occupying the space, but they have a lease coming up in nine months, so it's being marketed. OK? I don't know why we do that. It's confusing. We, it makes us sound smarter. So, so we, we, we explain it, and then we sound like we know what we're talking about. But um, there's, there's a distinction there that you should understand. Generally, as you saw with our previous folks, uh, Barry and so forth, things are trending upward. This is just a snapshot. This is just second quarter. Um, and sometimes the quarters can be a little bit off because they, they're variables that affect a, a three-month stretch. But, but the trend is, is certainly on the uprise, both from a, well, on the, on the downward slope from a vacancy standpoint, um, on the upward slope when it comes to, to average rents and asking rents. And absorption. Um, on the next slide is really a key stat in commercial real estate. Um, we're all about jobs and bodies and seats. That's a, that's a key figure for us. It means there's true organic growth. So absorption is if a company is in 5,000 square feet and they move across the street to 10, that's a 5,000 square foot absorption number. I think most of you understand that. So that's true growth. That means they had to hire people to fill an additional 5,000 square feet. And, uh, and, and that's obviously good for the economy in a, in a number that we watch very closely. So you can see from these stats that those numbers have been trending upward. We're on pace to match 2012, which was a record year in and of itself um, across the board. Cambridge, as you saw from the other slide, is a small market. Um, and we, we break New England down, well, we break the Boston market down into downtown Boston, Cambridge, and the suburbs. We look at those three areas sort of uh, separately. And Cambridge, while it's small, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, but just, re just remember there's a lot that comes out of Cambridge. Um, Barry, you, you live there, so you, you see it every day. Um, there's just a lot of drivers, a lot of companies that are being created there that grow up and become adults and take big chunks of space out on, out on 128, 495. Um, the vacancy numbers, we've talked about those already. Again, trending down, good sign. Um, so what does that mean? 
that means upward pressure on rents. And that's been happening um, over the last few years as well. Um, but there's, a real, there's an interesting story about rents. It's not been equal. The rising tide has not really raised all the boats. Um, now we're drilling down into the Metro West here specifically with a look at Framingham Natick figures and uh, 495 figures. And actually, I left 128 off here by, by mistake. Um, because in the western suburbs, where we all live and work, um, we look at those three markets all the time. 128, Framingham, Natick, 495. We call them the Metro West, but they're very, very different. The, the top rental rates on Route 128 today at a place like the Wellesley Office Park, which is not a new park, okay? And people come from out of town and they look at those rusted buildings that were built that way on purpose, and they think, wow, you know, you're getting... They're, the rents are in the mid-40s in the Wellesley Office Park on Route 128. The highest rents in the Framingham Natick market are in the, in the high 20s. And the highest rents on 495 today are in the, the low 20s. The, that gap has never been so wide. <clears throat> that's, that's, a, that's a real big difference in rents. And what it's doing is uh, while, while we're hearing about urbanization, there's a lot of companies and a lot of people, empty nesters and so forth, that are going back into the cities, into Boston and Cambridge and so forth. We're not really, we don't see that happening in a, in a commercial real estate standpoint. It's still, frankly, the movement the other way, where rents are cheaper. Um, uh, okay. So sales activity, um, there's a, it's been fairly active over the last couple of years. You couldn't really get much of anything done in terms of sales uh, in, the, in the Great Recession, um, but that's starting to change. Um, I'll pull two, two deals out here and specifically to talk about them anecdotally. The second one, the second bullet point there, Normandy, which is a New Jersey-based private real estate partnership, <clears throat> bought a building right out our front door here. 15 Pleasant Street Connector was a former Genzyme building. Um, and uh, they paid about $60 per square foot for the building. It was empty, dead empty. Genzyme's lease had come up. They moved out. Building was rather old, tired. Henry Fitzgerald knows that well. He lived and worked in the building for many years. Um, uh, and, so, and, that's a pr and you can expand the building by about 50,000 square feet. So it sounds like a real bargain. And it would, they, they bought it at the right price. But that building needs just about everything, including systems. The entire inside needs to be gutted. Some may say it needs a new skin um, on the outside as well. Um, and uh, and if, you, if you take the land value that they bought, which is maybe $30 a foot, they paid $30 a foot for the building. Sounds like an even better bargain. But they probably have to spend $150, $200 a foot to put that building into, back into shape for the next tenant. Um, the other one that's sort of an interesting deal is National Development's purchase of the old seal test plant that you can see on the Mass Pike. Everybody knows the building. They made ice cream there for many years. Great, great building to tour, right? Because as a big ice cream fan, you go and you see all this ice cream making equipment. But National bought it, um, industrial site. Environmentally, it wasn't much of a problem, but um, probably going to have to scrape the scrape the the building down. So they basically bought, basically bought a land site. They paid four and a half million dollars for a site where they can build about 150,000 square feet, I want to say. So that's about $30 per square foot for the land, which, which is about right. Um, although, one more interesting thing about that, that deal, with all that ice cream making equipment inside, there was stainless steel everywhere. And the cost of, I didn't realize this, there's $900,000 worth of stainless steel in the building that evidently you could harvest and, and recycle and sell to, uh, to some stainless steel guy. So, so really, they bought the building for, for less money, for three, really $3.5 million. So sort of an interesting deal there. Marcus Partners purchased 111 Speen Street, which is the pink and gray building. People used to call it the good and plenty building, although it's faded a little bit now. It doesn't look quite so pink and gray. but um, uh, they bought that together with a tenant in the building. Another sort of interesting deal, which is why we pulled it out. The tenant had an option to buy the building. The building's 110,000 square feet. The tenant was in about 10,000 square feet. That's sort of unusual for a tenant of that size to buy a building or to even have an option. But they did. They found a money partner. They exercised the option. 
and uh, now they own the building jointly with, um, with Marcus Partners, a private local real estate company, Boston-based. Um, tenant news, I think, is even more interesting because this is really what drives the market. Um, you need tenants to make the world go round. TGX has been a big story, of course. They've had, um, they did a big deal out in Marlboro a year or so ago, and, um, and, and we're going to sublease a big chunk of space they had in Framingham, not at their headquarters, but nearby at 500 Old Connecticut Path. And they've now decided that they, don't, they won't do that. They need that space. So that's 270,000 square feet in Framingham that is now off the market. Um, two things I want to pull out of here that, that um, may have some interest. ADP signed a lease at Two Vision Drive in Natick for 52,000 square feet. They were on Route 128. That goes back to the story that I was saying about tenants moving from the, wet, from the east to the west, right? So ADP had a lot of back office operation that, um, um, you know, it's sort of a warehouse for people, I should say. I, I mean, the people that work in there. I'm, I'm, um, but it was, they, they really just need, gene, need a generic space. They weren't able to pay the high prices that exist on Route 128. So they came out to, uh, uh, to the Cognex building in Natick. That's an example of that movement. Um, Avery Dennison, great story. Um, company that we represent. We were helping them look around the market. Old line Framingham company, right? Been here forever. Dennison Manufacturing, their final group in Framingham. They've been cutting down gradually over the last 15, 10 or 15 years. Um, so, and, and this last group that remained, they were selling the building that they were in down in South Framingham. They had to move. They wanted to stay in Framingham, but they wanted much different space. They wanted a, this was, this division of theirs was actually the, the driver of their business. It's a very high tech oriented division. It's called retail brand services or something. <clears throat> and um, we, we went driving around one day looking at what was available in Framingham and Natick. And at the end of the day, the, uh, the guy from Avery Dennison who, was from, who came from out of town, from California, said, and I won't use the words that he used, but he said, I can't believe what you just showed me. There's, there's, there's nothing here that's remotely near what we're looking for. We want modern, clean, new, high-tech, funky space. Um, and it, it dawned on me, you know, there's the, the stock here, Paul and I were talking about this earlier, there's a lot of buildings that we call Class A in the Metro West, even on 128, but much more so in Framingham, Natick, and 495 that were built in the 80s and early 90s. Those were old buildings. So anyway, they wound up in, in Westboro. They would have stayed in Framingham if they could have found that kind of space. Here again, on a, on a bigger scale, a lot of these deals are sort of old news, but some of the largest employers here in the Metro West have moved from Framingham Natick and gone out to 495 to find those big chunks of space. Marlboro was a, was a big story, um, what, now two years ago when Fidel Fidelity pulled out and gave up 750,000 square feet. HP was cutting back drastically. They were giving up uh, another, another 770,000 square feet right next door. So Marlboro all of a sudden overnight had over, way over a million square feet of space available. And that was filled um, very quickly by TJX, Quest, Diagnostic, Quest Diagnostics, the deal that we talked about earlier, went to a project in Marlboro. Um, uh, Boston Scientific uh, moved when they got pushed out by growing MathWorks to, uh, to Marlboro, to the old Stratus campus out there. And BJ's, which is now a few years ago, went from Natick out to Westboro. When you do a lot of these larger companies, and even smaller ones that are in Framingham and Natick, and we run these zip code analyses for them, where, you know, it's, it's old, old hat now, it's, it's nothing new, but you, you take the, the, the employee zip codes and you, you graph them and you show where, they're, where, they're sent, where the best um, uh, drive times are for them to be located and so forth. All of them are centered. The, the center point for all of those companies um, is out on 495. It's usually in Westboro, Southboro, maybe, maybe even Milford. Some of them are south on 495. So that's where they go, to be a little closer to their folks and get cheaper space. Now, a few deals that um, uh, some of these were already talked about. We talked about 15 Pleasant Street Connector and 492 Old Connecticut Path. 492 is the national development deal, the old SEAL test, and 15 Pleasant Street is the Normandy deal right next door. 
These are, this is what the next wave of news will be about. I think within the next year or so, we'll hear about new deals happening in these buildings, and they're getting built and, uh, so that they can catch those companies like Avery Dennison that otherwise would have stayed in Framingham if, if, they, if they could find good space. The deal we haven't talked about is, again, right outside our front door. It's the old, um, it's 125 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's the old, um, sorry, I'm blanking, the paper company. International Paper, which you saw um, right on the, right on the uh, exit 12 Mass Pike ramp there for many years. They moved out a few years ago. The site was bought by Dean Stratuli, a Boston-based developer with Congress Group Ventures. Um, he, w he had planned, and he bought two other small buildings right next to it. His plan was to tear everything down and build a big 350,000 square foot shining property that he would have leased to either Genzyme or Bose. That didn't happen. So now he's going to take the existing buildings, older industrial buildings, strip them down, make them the cool, funky space of today that tenants are talking about, and see if he can catch some of those Avery Dennison type tenants who uh, would like to be in the Framingham Natick area. Uh, a few more projects. Uh, again, I guess we touched on these. Um, Forest Park is the Atlantic Management Project out in Marlboro, the old HP site that was bought by um, uh, Joe Zink and his group, Atlantic Management, based right here in, uh, based in Natick. Um, the TGX campus we talked about and, um, and Boston Scientific. Boston Scientific. Stratus actually went and put a, put a flag out in Marlboro many years ago. Um, that company shrunk, of course, and Boston Scientific took that over and recently is going to repopulate it even further now, moving out of their NADA campus. So um, workplace trends, I've been touching on this all along, but in Boston, you know, we're, we're very much like these other markets that are tech-oriented, San Francisco, Austin, Texas, and Midtown South New York City. And, um, and it seems like almost every tenant meeting that we're in, um, the, the, the and, and you know these companies are all worldwide now. Even the small ones have offices in these places, and they're sh they're sharing stories about what they want, you know, what they have in other locations, how New England can be a little stodgy. You know, we can't really change the red brick on the outside of the building, but let's do what we can on the inside to make it um, a place that really enables employ employers. Kevin was talking about recruiting and how important it is to find that talent. People are using their space as much as possible to, um, to recruit and to find talent. And these are some of the things that, we, uh, that we're hearing about every day when we talk to tenants. Open space, amenity-rich environments, food service. Some companies give free food to keep the employees there. They, don't, they think it's great, but really what they're doing is they're, they're, they're captured, right? They don't want them going anywhere, so they work all day long. And, give them a free lunch and give them free dinner and they'd sleep over, I suppose, if they could. Um, some more workplace trends. I've seen Steelcase, which is a big office furniture manufacturer. They have a, um, a treadmill desk now um, that, yeah, and there's a governor on it. You can't run, but you can walk at a very slow, steady space at a desktop. And, uh, and there are not a lot of them out there. It's, it's a, it's a, you know, what do you call it? It's a, it's a test, but I guess they're being gobbled up, so you may see more of those. But lots of innovations within the space. Mostly open, collaborative. We hear that all the time. Uh, very few private offices. There's some companies that are a little different than that. MathWork is buck, buck, bucking the trend, but doing very well at it, obviously. Uh, but it seems like, boy, it seems like the whole rest of the world is just um, having a very different kind of a, wanting a very different kind of a work environment. <clears throat> And that's it. I'll end on that note. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. That was very informative. And uh, it's nice to see that we do have a few buildings that will be considered a class A space out here. And uh, I think that we will continue to see that kind of growth. We have time for a few questions. We have about seven or eight or 10 minutes, maybe. Who, um, who wants to start with questions? Uh, just a question on, uh, oh, here we go. This is on. Hello. Uh, you mentioned a couple of trends there. I have a couple of, two sons in their 20s. They're working now. Um, some of the trends you described apply to most of us, the baby boomers in the room. 
maybe not to the under 30 crowd. I know MathWorks is trying to get the younger people into Metro West. Both of my boys live in Boston. They do reverse commutes to jobs on 128. Uh, they do not want to own a car. They're more interested in hub cycle and zip car. Uh, and their phones and being near where the activity is in Boston. So I, that kind of contradicts a little bit on some of the trends mentioned about the larger corporations moving still outward toward 495. I also have brothers an engineer. He says he can't hire anybody under 30 because he's out in uh, Hudson. They all want to be in Cambridge, which I think you mentioned also, that Cambridge is his own economy there uh, and with almost zero uh, vacancy rate. So if you can comment on that sort of trend, what's the under 30 crowd doing and how it's different from the baby boomers? Let me say just a word about that because I actually have a son the same age. Uh, he'll be 22 next month. He's at Northwestern University. And um, uh, the Boston Globe recently, during the summer, did a whole thing on, a for on housing and they interviewed me and there was a sidebar and my last line was to think that my son or any of his friends would want to live the way my parents did and when I did when I first married in a small suburban home with a two car you know garage is appalling to him and his friends and we see this among all my graduate students I see it all among all of our young faculty they don't necessarily all want to live in Cambridge in fact very few do because none of them can afford it they are living in places like Jamaica Plain, but what they're looking for is transit-oriented sites with denser housing and lots of amenities. And they can be out in Metro West, as long as we create the kind of environment they want. We're going to be releasing our 11th annual housing report card on October 10th at the Boston Foundation. Every year we track housing and everything about it. And what we're finding now is that the demographic shift of old folks like me who are going to be downsizing from their bigger homes and this new millennial generation that is looking for the same kind of housing is going to make for a dramatic change in our housing patterns, just revolutionary compared with the kind of post-war suburban tracks that we built by the millions. Uh, there's one estimate out nationally that there'll be somewhere between two to four million surplus single family homes by 2025. Um, the real question is whether communities like the Metro West communities are going to allow for denser, multifamily, multi-unit housing in much larger numbers. Developers have learned the demography. 2000 to 2002, two-thirds of all the new housing units built in Greater Boston, which includes most of Metro West, 161 communities, two-thirds were single-family homes. Over the last two years, two-thirds have been multifamily, apartments and condos. So to a great extent, the demography of the future, built on the millennials and on aging baby boomers like myself, is going to be looking for kind of the suburban village with lots of amenities, lots of good transportation options, because you don't want me driving when I'm 90 years old. <laughs> and we have to figure out which communities in the greater Boston area are going to build for that new demography. Kevin, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, um, so I think what we see is uh, th th there's two allures, one you mentioned, which is actually the reverse commute. So a, a huge number of our, our sort of our, our new wave of staff are coming from inside the city. And they actually like, number one, the reverse commute. And I think the thing that they enjoy about working in MathWorks is actually what Chris said, which is we've tried to create an environment in um, all of our development effort, not just with our purchases, but all the work that we've done on Apple Hill and Natick right now is, is, was done to really create a sense of, it, it's a campus, it's, it's truly a campus now, where we don't have roads going through um, between buildings anymore. We've literally created a central space of just grass and tables, and, and it's amazing how people have taken to that. I mean, it is truly like a college campus now, which they're not that far afield from, right? And so um, there's a lot of appeal to that. And they offer free cookies on Friday. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. There's no question. Um, the only thing I can say is there's still um, a bunch of gray-haired people in the workforce. And, um, and, you know, those companies that are more mature um, and, and maybe have the, uh, a worker that's more mature or more apt to go out to 495. The, um, um, 
you know, I wonder what's going to happen. I mean, we were all young once. I, wanted, I lived in Boston when I was in my 20s. Got married, had some kids, things change. So I don't know what's going to happen um, uh, in the future, but um, it's, it's, de it's definitely a struggle right now. We have some more questions. Chris, Representative Walsh. Thank you. Uh, uh, as well as being the state rep from this area, I'm, I'm also an architect, so I'm very sensitive to these, uh, uh, these issues in terms of place. And when Dr. Bluestone was talking, I was, I was thinking quality of life, quality of life. Uh, because it was always sort of second in all of your uh, uh, things. And I think there was a, a story about Abraham Lincoln saying that if he was everybody's second choice for president, it was good enough for him, and, and we know what happened. So quality of life, and as the, as the panel went on, you really saw that sort of quality of life spike, where people really are talking about not so much the business part of it, but what comes with it? If you're going to attract that quality person, you have to bring other things to the table. And so you, when the, Dr. Plistone was talking about manufacturing be, being sort of wide ranging so one sector never got hit, I think, and I'd like your reaction on this, uh, that communities can offer a wide range some areas that are sort of urban and dense and some areas that are suburban and some areas that are actually rural um, stand a chance to attract a wide range of people. And so that, that, that's my comment, but it's really more of a, is there a reaction to that? Right on. <laughs> that's a phrase we used to use in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, and the, I think the downtown areas also uh, perfectly situated to solve this issue, whether or not a place like downtown Framingham, you know, which has, every downtown has its challenges, but, um, you know, you've got an urban environment right in, in the middle of, of the Metro West, a suburban town with, um, you know, the, the town has put zoning in place to allow for, for mixed use, for apartments above retail, got some colleges that are talking about locating down there. Those are the kind of things that can really turn things around and, and, uh, and create that, that kind of environment. Be game changer. Hi, I'm really impressed with the presentation of all three of you. Uh, thank you very much. It was well worth my time from the business analysis perspective. I missed the earlier comment. Somebody asked whether or not there was going to be access to these slide decks online. And um, I'd just like an answer from all three if you wouldn't mind. Is that possible? them all online? Yep. There's your answer. Bill? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Barry, this is more directed to you because uh, we have a, a great regional collaboration here on economic development with the different entities that are out here. But there's an importance that I think we're missing and in, in your EDSTAT is, shows us this, that each community right now is looking at what they can do to draw and bring business here. and make a better quality of life. Where, from my perspective, the big picture is, as a region, how, what do we do to work better together? Uh, what do we do to get our communities more involved on a regional basis so that the people in charge in each of those communities know that we don't have, we don't have borders. The borders are down. We have to work as a region. And uh, I, I'd just like your take on that, if you could. Well, I think, Bill, you're exactly right. And I, and I applaud Metro West chamber for working regionally in doing that. And we've been all over the state talking about regional development. I mean, if you go out and you ask people who don't live here, tell me about Westboro, no one has a clue. Ask them, do you know anything about Metro West? Well, they'll think of the Natick Mall, they'll think about Route 9, but they have a better idea that there's a region out here. You know, it, it's almost less important whether you get a firm to locate in Southboro versus Westboro particularly if you get some of the folks who work there living in the communities around there. We found, for example, in our EDSAT results uh, that firms were less concerned about the crime rate in, their, in the specific location where they are and so forth as long as they could draw, draw a labor force from the broader region. And they're looking for regions where you have that high-skilled, highly motivated workforce with all the amenities that we've been talking about and, quite frankly, firms like MathWorks that are exciting places to work. And those are regional magnets. 
And the more you can work together, the better. Let me give you an example of what we've been doing. We've been doing a lot of work in Lynn. Lynn's a tough city. Hmm. We've been doing a lot of work in Quincy, where they're completely rebuilding their downtown, specifically around the new demographic of old people like me and young millennials. Um, big, big billion dollar plus developments in downtown. We've now been talking with Senator McGee, about, who's the head of transportation in the Senate and comes from Lynn, about how do you improve transportation, which is god awful if you're commuting down Route 3 or commuting up Route 3 in the morning. And of course, going up one is impossible to Lynn. And we're talking about high speed hydrofoil to start bringing together a triangle that goes from Lynn to the South Boston Innovation District in Kendall Square and Logan Airport down to Quincy and linking all of those and selling that as the new region where development can take place. You can imagine young folks who just aren't going to be able to afford that apartment in the new South Boston Innovation District, but a beautiful condo or rental apartment on the waterfront in Lynn, 22 minutes away from the Innovation District in Boston, that's attractive. In the same way you can think about Metro West as being something that not only attracts great firms like MathWorks, but also becomes a region that young people want to move to and older folks rather than saying we're moving to something else including you know Palm Beach say these are this is the kind of housing stock this is my community these are the churches I belong to but I don't want that old home I have I can't really take care of it I'm not ready for the nursing home but what do you have downtown in Framingham or Natick or Westboro Southboro in a village setting where I have most of the amenities I want that's the regional mindset we need to get, and we need to sell it as a region. I'm afraid that we are out of time because it is 10 o'clock, so I think these fine gentlemen will be here for a little bit if you want to try to catch them afterwards and ask your questions. How about a round of applause for our panelists? And Peter Stanton is going to come back and close us out. Bonnie, thank you so much. A terrific, terrific job by all our panelists. Um, I just want to thank again Windstream. If we look at their logo, it, it looks a little bit like one of Barry's slides, doesn't it? Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Um, and uh, our, our corporate sponsors, as well as our partners, Metro West 495 Partnership, Framingham State University, and the Metro West Chamber of Commerce. And Bonnie, thank you for also moderating as well. Special thanks to Curry Printing, Mark Serra Productions, and Revelation Productions, a firm we work at with all of our events, which is those uh, those spectacular guys in the back of the room who jumped when we had a problem with the slides and fixed it just in time uh, for Michael's uh, presentation. So, uh, and again, for help uh, with the survey and everything, the Corridor 9 Chamber, the Marlboro Chamber, Milford Area Chamber, and United Regional. So all those partners helped make this happen. Thank you for coming. Thank you to our panel, and uh, have a terrific morning.